chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, um, and uh, preaching the second of two sermons from this, um, this chapter here. Um, um, and as I said last Lord's Day evening, an introduction to the, um, the first part of the sermon, um, this is a chapter that places before us uh, the the great what what I call the, the great business of the church uh, this this great work that the church is involved in the work of seeing men and women converted to Jesus Christ this work that we are instrument in instruments in in God's hands for and um, amongst the other things and the wider things that are happening in the in the book of Acts you know we, we just um, at least in, in the context of this passage, we've just seen the martyrdom of Stephen and how that led to the persecution as well as the scattering of the church. Now, in chapter 8, Luke zeroes in on the ministry of one Philip in a similar way that he has zeroed in earlier on in the ministry of Stephen. Remember in chapter 6 and 7, um, he, he, uh, Stephen is one of those seven men that are, are called and are appointed by the church to help deal with some of the, uh, the, 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 the issues that they were having uh, with uh, uh, serving the tables in the church, if you want. And Stephen is one of those men that is trusted to help maintain and lead the church, uh, lead the unity of the church. And um, Luke zeroes in on his ministry. Um, and then, but Philip is also one of those seven men alongside um, Stephen are introduced to us in chapter 6. And here in chapter 8 now, after Stephen's martyrdom, Luke tells us about how God continued to do great works through the ministry of Philip. And in that sense, Philip is not a representative, you see, of, of great people among us. That's not ultimately what he represents. I think in, in Luke's writing, Philip more likely represents the the ministry of the church he is he 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 leaves us as the church it gives us things to reflect on and um, reminds us of what our mission is and uh, one of the things we see in, in this chapter is as i say is that the church has a is is, is bound to be work, involved in this work of conversion and last week we saw what was a more it was a a more a false, you might say, spurious example of conversion with Simon the magician, who um, to some extent was, was, was saying the right things and seemed to be doing, was doing some of the right things, but ultimately was, he was exposed in his heart to have been a, a, a false convert, someone who wasn't genuinely seeking the Lord Jesus. And um, a reminder to, it was a reminder to us as the church that in this business of, of, of conversion and of, of preaching and seeking for, for the glory of God, seeking men and women to come to Christ, we, we must not be careless, we must not be naive. Um, and um, we must not do it just because we want to increase in numbers. The, 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 the apostles were, and the church were, the early church was certainly not, not like that. They weren't just, you know, they, just, they weren't just concerned for the numbers. They weren't just trying to increase the church. They, they were concerned for the glory of God. And um, there was important instruction for us about conversion and discipleship from um, Simon in a kind of what not to do sense. Well, tonight we have a more positive example of a conversion, a more positive representation of conversion. In this encounter, uh, another encounter that Philip has now, uh, with with someone who is re referred to often in our Bibles, the Ethiopian eunuch, because those are the two um, major descriptors, especially though he's identified as a eunuch. We know he's from Ethiopia, but particularly this eunuch um, he's identified. And in uh, Philip's encounter with him, um, that leads to his conversion, right? A, a more positive representation. Um, when we close with Simon in chapter 8, early on, um, sorry, with, yes, by Simon I mean Simon the magician. 
uh, not Simon Peter. Let me close with Simon the magician. Well, we close with Simon Peter saying to him, um, you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon kind of crying for help. You know, Simon um, is horrified at the words that Peter spoke to him. But in this encounter that we see tonight, Thomas goes his way, the eunuch sees him no more, verse 39, but he goes on his way rejoicing. So this is uh, an example of, of genuine conversion, an example of um, genuine spiritual transformation. And it's, it, the church must even more so take up this example and long for it and seek, seek it, as it were, and, and learn from, from it. So that's what we'll, we'll do tonight, look at um, Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, and I want to draw your attention to, to four main things, really, four, four things tonight, uh, four things that stand as an instruction for us as a church as to, um, in, in this, help to put conversion in its rightful place, place conversion before our eyes, and hopefully, I trust, fill us with a longing to see more men and women come to Jesus Christ, come to, to know him. Um, so, four things, and uh, first thing is what, what we learn from this, this passage about the nature of conversion. Now, um, once again, just as far as a, a summary is concerned, you, 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 uh, some of you may know the story, um, but Philip is divinely instructed, right? Verse 26, an angel of the Lord says to Philip, to head to this, head to, towards the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Um, and he's clearly sent to meet with this um, Ethiopian eunuch, this, this man who's this seemingly powerful man, um, who's reading the scriptures when Philip finds him. He's reading the book of Isaiah, but doesn't quite understand what he's reading. And he, he's seeking for instruction. He asks if Philip can tell him what this is about. And Philip does. Philip preaches Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch believes, so is baptized, and um, he leaves rejoicing for how God has changed his life and how the grace of God had met him. That's the basic summary of what happens here. Uh, but, also, but, but, but far more instructive than that. Some of the most basic truths of our faith, the you know, I could spend, I could uh, take just the first point and probably e quite easily preach uh, a whole sermon on that, uh, just my first point tonight, uh, but uh, I won't do that. And I'll, I'll just, I believe that a lot of the things that I'm saying are, are basic to our understanding and, and that what we are longing for is to be constantly seeing these things freshly with freshness and understanding their importance and their weightiness. Um, so yeah, the first thing is what it tells us about the nature of conversion. Let me, let me show you that I wasn't just exaggerated when I said I could preach a three-point sermon for this. Because there's three points I want to draw your attention to from the first point. Uh, right? Three, three things to see. About how, about the, the nature of conversion and, and how we do, and the work of conversion. Well, the first thing I, I want to draw your attention to, and... I have to say that I think a lot of what I'm about to say comes from uh, me almost wanting to, to react and respond to um, certain wrong views that you, you see around um, when it comes to people talking about conversion. And when we talk about conversion, you know, some people are really opposed to the idea that Christians will, will speak of wanting to convert, wanting to change people, and they see it as unloving, um, they see it as... Uh, it's just wrong to try and make someone believe what you, you, um, you believe. But, but, well, one thing I want to say tonight then is that in every single account of conversion in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, you find that none of it is by compulsion, right? None of it is by compulsion. Um, Christian conversion is not manipulative. It's not trying to manipulate Conversion is not oppressive. We're not forcing people to believe. Christians don't force people to believe this message. You, you can see that in every single example. There are men and women who are themselves 
who, are f- who freely, we know that God's grace, if there's anything that, that, if you want to say, compels us in the most, it's, it's the grace of God. But nothing to do with um, human manipulation. Nothing to do with threats and blackmails and blackmail. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's free. And you see it quite clearly here in what you might say, the social dynamic between um, the Ethiopian unit. Now, the Ethiopian, for every intent and purpose, probably he's an example of a, a powerful figure. It might be that we can contrast this eunuch who served one, one Candice, a, a queen of the Ethiopians, and was a treasurer, and so most likely was, was quite wealthy himself, who occupied royal position to some degree. Um, we might contrast him with the people of um, Samaria, who seemed quite gullible to some degree. They, they, they saw Simon, they saw him as, as a god because of some tricks he performed, and maybe not as, as wise. They were maybe not as sophisticated, as civilized as the Ethiopian eunuch is here. Um, and lest you should think, well, the people in Samaria come to, they come to Jesus Christ because of that reason, because they're not intelligent and, you know, this is someone imposing themselves on that. Well, we have the contrast of the Ethiopian eunuch. And to see that actually that's not the case, that the preaching the gospel is not involving ourselves in attempting to manipulate people in attempting to exploit their, their feelings, their hardships. It's not about that. We don't force people into the faith. Um, the eunuch offers Philip, invites him um, to, to explain. How will I understand if no one guides me? He invites him. There's no compulsion in, in this. And there's no, nothing like that. In all of the accounts of conversion that you see in the New Testament, we want the word to be compelling, but that's the work of the Spirit. We want the word to constrain, but that's the work of the Spirit. We want people to receive our preaching with a sense of urgency, but that's the work of the Spirit. So, um, governments have no business ruling out or opposing the preaching of the gospel because they fear that it is contrary to the practices of a free country. It's not the case at all. This, this is not, this is, we, we're not going out to force people. I hope, I'm sure, none of you were forced here tonight. I'm sure none of you were forced to believe this message, to join this church. Um, there's that. So there's not, no compulsion in our conversion. We must, not do convert, we must not do ministry in that way. Now, now let me be careful to say that, that there are people who do ministry that way. And we must, re- we must, we must uh, reject that. We must, um, we must rightfully be critical of that, right? People who try and manipulate, uh, people who try and take advantage of people's uh, uh, insecurities, you know, people who are, in, who are down and out and, you know, and force uh, and kind of manipulate them into receiving the gospel. Well, we want to reject that outrightly. We want to say that's not biblical. Right? But, but genuine biblical conversion doesn't require us, us to uh, compel people in that way. The other thing, but we might say, though, about the nature of conversion, just from these passages, is that it's, it's, it's Catholic. Now, I think I might have made this point before. I'm doing a membership classes with, uh, on Sunday afternoons. And in our membership classes, we are learning about the, the nature of the church, the doctrine of the church. And um, in doing that, I've, I've employed a historical like creed, confession, the Nicene Creed, and said, so there's a sentence in the, in the Nicene Creed that says we believe in one uh, holy Catholic, apostolic church, basically. It's a, it's, a, it's a statement, this confession of faith. And I've used this historic uh, statement, creed, to kind of explain the nature of the church in the Bible, what the Bible says about what the church is like, what the church is. And I say to them, one of the things that the Bible says about the church is the church is Catholic. And by that, I don't mean that it's, you know, it's Roman Catholic 
It's not in the slightest. I don't mean that. I know that's a popular um, meaning of the term today, and I'm not the one that, I didn't write the Nicene Creed, so you know, take it up with them. What the phrase means is that it's universal. This is really importantly stressed here. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and conversion is for all kinds of people. As, as, as I, I say in my, in my uh, membership classes, the church is, belongs to all types of people. There's not a particular, if you want, there's not a particular type of person for Jesus. You can't say, look at him, he's, he's, he's smooth. Look at her, she's intelligent. Look at the way he walks. Look at their upbringing. And say, this is the kind of person for Jesus. You can't say that. God saves all types of people. Um, I remember we, we, there was a sermon preacher, and I tried to remember the title. I couldn't. But uh, we, we used to have a, a preacher here, Pastor, his name was uh, Ashil Blaze. And he preached here for a long number of years, over and over again. Um, and I remember, I think it might be the last sermon he preached here. It might be the last evening sermon I heard him preach here, which was a number of years ago. And he preached from this passage, and his title was something like, the, uh, something like, this is not actually what it was, but, it, but I, I'm, there's a part of it that I know I definitely got right. It was like the, 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 the first conversion, the conversion of the first black man or something like that. That black man I definitely got right. Yeah, the conversion of the first black man. I remember sitting in my pulpit in the pew and hearing and I'm thinking, what's this? What's this guy? What's he preaching about? Like, why would he even call his sermon that? Um, but he was really trying to, he was stressing the point that what we see very early on in the church is God is saving all types of people. And there's this good reason. Most commentators think that it's a fair statement to say that the Ethiopian eunuch was a black man, right? Um, he, he, um, he probably had he'd come across the Jewish religion at some point. He might have been a, a, like a convert to, the, to, 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 to Judaism. Perhaps he... He, he believed some tenets of Judaism, although he couldn't express full, he couldn't um, experience full covenant privileges. He was a eunuch, and eunuchs weren't allowed, for example, for, weren't allowed to enjoy certain temple privileges. He could, he could be in the courtyard, perhaps, but not in the temple itself because he was a eunuch. He was ceremonially um, unclean for that reason. Um, and so uh, that probably explains his reading of the, um, his reading of the, of the scroll, maybe he had he'd gone to Jerusalem and was heading his, heading back home, intrigued by this, by this, uh, by, by by Judaism and, and God's word. Um, but he was, he, but but everything is being stressed to us that he's 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 not your typical, he's not a typical Jew if you want. He was a different person, but it doesn't matter. Even for him, Christ can be all in all. Even for him, Christ saves. Even he needs Christ, even this Ethiopian eunuch, powerful and wealthy as he was, he needed Christ. Very instructive. Sometimes the church thinks only the poor need Christ. You know, sometimes um, we act as though only the poor can be saved. Or like, or that poverty in and of itself um, makes, draws men to Jesus. Not in and of itself, right? It doesn't do that. And sometimes we act like, you know, the intellectual, the powerful, the wealthy cannot experience the grace of Jesus. A man like uh, this Ethiopian eunuch, he must have been serving in, um, in, a, in, a, in a very, if you want, pagan, godless um, nation. They, they, they didn't have the oracles of God um, and, and, you know, I, I wonder what it was like for him going back to, um, to, his, uh, to his, his country and, and going back to serve under the Queen of Ethiopia. And the tensions he would have had to face now that he wants to follow Jesus, now that Philip would have told him Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords, he's King of Kings, he alone is God. Um, and all, all that meant for him... Um, Luke doesn't tell us much about that. The point is, though, that God can save. And we really need to realize that God can save all types of people. Um, God can save doctors and musicians, and he can save criminals, and the church is universal in that sense. And we must, uh, we must recognize that.
It's the nature of conversion. We, there sh we, sh we should never be looking at people and thinking, I'm not going to share the gospel with them. They're not going to hear me. They don't want to receive it. That being said, all types of people can hear the gospel. It's not under compulsion. Just one thing about the, the character of the Ethiopian eunuch, though, and that's that there was, he, he did have, he had, a, he had a desire to know the things of God. Um, and so you see um, that Philip finds him reading. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? So he's reading out loud, most likely, uh, that's how most people read in those times. He was privileged enough to be able to read and to be able to own a scroll for himself, which said that he was quite wealthy. Uh, but the nature of the scrolls meant that it was far more easier to read loud and read out than it was to try and uh, than it was to read silently or quietly. Um, and when Philip asks him, he says, "How can I, unless someone guides me?" There is a desire; he's desperate to know. He wants to know the things of God. Um, so he invites Philip, "Come up and sit with me." This man he doesn't know because Philip is clearly intimating that he can explain the things of God to the. The, uh, the, the Ethiopian eunuch. And after Philip reads, finds him reading the book of uh, Isaiah and part of uh, Isaiah that we just read, Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8, that's what um, Philip finds him reading. He says, who, who is this talking about? Who is, who is this passage about? Who is it talking about? Um, someone, someone suggested, later on in Isaiah 56, Right in the book of Isaiah, when you, if you read Isaiah fifty-six, Isaiah fifty-six is this passage about how God promises to to remove the the hindrances, to remove the barriers to come into His presence that certain people faced because of the ceremonial uncleanness. Even eunuchs, for example, in Isaiah fifty-six, God says, "Even the eunuch will be welcome now to." to worship me, to walk close to with me, will no longer be treated as impure and no longer treated as unclean and uh, um, no longer treated as unworthy to enjoy certain privileges. And it's possible that maybe the eunuch haven't read that, haven't read in Isaiah 56 that there was a promise of grace for even someone like him. He's asking Philip, who is the man who is reading about in Isaiah 53, who can possibly secure these benefits for me, who can invite me to this way of salvation? Well, maybe. Either way, the point is there is a desire on the part of this man. There is, there is a desire to know God. And we must be careful about that as well in teaching the gospel. People, must, people are not going to be converted if they're not they don't see their need. There's no, there's, no, there's no seeing of the need for a savior. Can't force people to be converted. That means there must be a desire to know God. There must be a sense that, that now we, of course we, we, we pray for God to awaken desire. That's why we share the gospel with people. We want God to awaken a desire within them. But if there is no desire for God and his ways, people will not be saved. And so we must pray for that. But, but you must be, you must... An unbeliever must see their need. They must, they must ask questions about eternity. They must ask questions about sin and see um, how their sin has separated from God. They must, they must be sensitive to the reality of judgment now. Oh, there's, there's a judgment day. They must, they must understand the way of salvation and how Jesus Christ can deliver them from, from the wrath of God. There has to be that. right? Without those things, men and women don't come to, to know Jesus Christ. It's the nature of conversion. Uh, without that longing to understand who God is, to see who the God of the Bible is. So that's a, a few things to say about just what that passage reminds us about the nature of conversion. The other thing, though, is show that we see here in Isaiah, in Acts 8, in this story, is how instructive it is about the church's means of conversion, the means of conversion. Um, conversion, as I will say in closing, is ultimately the work of God. Only God can bring a soul to him. Only God can bring us to see how we need him. Only God can help us to see that we've all sinned. Only God can bring us to trust him. 
And yet God uses means. He uses means. And, um, and the, first, the first one is obvious, right? The scriptures. The scriptures are often God's means of converting souls. So the, at least that's the means we see here. Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. He's reading the scriptures. He's reading the word of God. We must not be, I don't think we must be, you know, careless of this and naive. And we must not treat the Bible as though it was a book of incantations, you know. I know, I know folks who, who don't give out tracts where there is like um, human writing. So, you know, like evangelistic tracts that have, but might, might have a short, um, you know, short word, a short explanation of the gospel. Um, they'll just give out tracts that, uh, where there's just Bible passages on them. You know, and this is a conviction they have because they feel like uh, only the word of God is, is sufficient for salvation and conversion. And, and that's probably an example of, well, I mean, for, of going too far, but even missing the point here, as you see shortly. Um, but I'm actually trying to use that example in a more positive sense to say I, I do admire to some degree the, the remembrance that the scriptures have power. This is God's word, okay? And I, we, must, we must really believe and remember. When I say really believe, what I mean is not just in word only, it must show in our approach to, the, to conversion and to seeking for souls to be converted, that the Bible is God's word and God's means for transforming the soul. And we, we must show, we, we need, and we must be full of Bible then. You know, we must be full of Bible. We, we must want to get Bibles into the hands of people. We must want to read scriptures. These words are life transforming. These are the words that God uses to reveal himself, the scriptures. Now, it's true. Apart from the grace of God, apart from the work of God, men and women do not see it. They don't see, this is, they don't see God's light in the word. But it is the means, the spirit-inspired words. And it's interesting that he's reading from the Old Testament. He's reading the book of Isaiah. He's reading uh, Isaiah. And a reminder to us as the church that all of God's word is profitable. All God's word is sufficient. And, right, rebuke to us if we, are, if we still remain um, unacquainted with our Old Testament. If we still don't care to, be, to have a greater understanding of our Old Testament. You know, you've been saved now 10, 15, 20 years, and you, you, you're, you're, and you still have such a poor grasp a poor acquaintance with the Old Testament. It's, it's a rebuke, is it not? Um, if we don't see that the same God of grace, the same Christ, as you see shortly, who is in the new is the same Christ as in the old. We must see that. And we don't have to be ashamed of any part of the Bible. I tell you, no part of the Bible. Most people who seem to be able to bring accusation against portions of the scripture, they, they do it because they have a... Uh, it's a monologue. It's a... It's a, it's a they have a, a, a solitary stage. It's a stage for themselves. They're allowed to speak and say what they want about the Bible. Imagine having a Philip. Let a Philip come up and explain to you that passage of Scripture that you're reading, that you're claiming, um, that you're claiming shows the Bible to be whatever you claim it to be. And you will see how God's Word is actually truly powerful, how it converts the soul, how it convicts. The Scriptures, the Scriptures, the Scriptures, we have to read it, you know, um, we uh, take, this, the, the, take the reading of Scripture properly. When I say take the reading of Scripture properly, uh, seriously, sorry, I'm even referring to the public reading of the Scriptures. We must really believe how God uses His Word on the soul. How many of us can't remember the last time we paid attention to a reading? Now, listen, people like me, myself, the preachers, we have to take the blame sometimes as well because maybe sometimes the, the congregation is feeding off the shoddy ways in which we come prepared to read the word. We're not prepared. We don't read God's word as if we believe. We don't read, we don't read enough of it. 
We don't read it with a sense that we know this is God speaking. Well, this is God speaking. This is God speaking in his word. And the scriptures are the means that God uses to transform the soul. Never mind that you don't understand Bitcoin or NFTs or, um, or so on and so forth. Never mind that. That one may change your pocket. Uh, for some of you, it might even drain it. This one will change your soul. It transforms souls. Be more concerned to know this, the scriptures. Right? And that's what Philip does. Philip knows the scriptures. This man reads Isaiah to Philip. And he says, can someone guide me? You know, sometimes, or oh friends, what, what unbelievers need someone to guide them. Are we ready? Well, this is my next point anyway. But so he needs someone to guide him. And Philip is able to, Philip sits with him, and he was reading. It was too obvious for, 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 for Stephen even, for Philip even, sorry. This passage of Scripture, the, the suffering servant of Isaiah that Christ had at points in the New Testament clearly hinted was even referring to him. Too easy for Philip to be able to say, this is about Jesus. And from there, from the Old Testament, from that passage in the Old Testament, verse 35 says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. In response to the Ethiopian Union's question, who is this passage about? And I think it's fair to say that this is Luke's reminder to us that his whole Bible is about Jesus. So yes, the means is scriptures that God uses for conversion. But it's scriptures as they point to Jesus. We must explain Christ from there. By the way, the, the point I was making about the tracts as well, you notice that Philip does have to explain, though. He, does ex he has to explain the scriptures. And I'm sure Philip explains the scriptures using his own, some, if you want, uninspired words, if you want to call it that. But particularly, Philip explains that this book is talking about Jesus. That's what's crucial for us. To see how Jesus, when you, if you're someone who's, you're reading your Bible on a daily basis, whether you're in Genesis, you're in Deuteronomy, you're in Judges, make sure you ask yourself, how is this pointing to Jesus? You might not be able to answer it then. It's, it's not always an easy science if you want. It's not always an easy thing to do. But why not take a note? Ask yourself questions. Put something down that you can share with another uh, brother or sister and ask them for counsel or, or ask them if they understand. But this is what we're, that's why we sang that hymn. That song, show us Christ. We want to see Jesus in the Word. We want to see Jesus in the Word. The means of, the, of conversion in the church are the scriptures read and proclaimed as pointing to Jesus. It's about Jesus. If you go to a church and someone is preaching from the Old Testament, and they they're claiming to be preaching the Old Testament. You have, you're listening for how are they showing us Christ in this? Um, and let's, we, we, must, we must strive to do that. So that's the church's means, right? The means of conversion is the scriptures, the Bible. That's why we read it. That's why we hold on to it daily. God uses this to transform the world. But the third thing, and this is probably, it should really fall in. It might be part of the second point I'm making, which is the means of conversion is the readiness of the church. The third thing here is I'm saying that Philip is meant to be an example of the readiness with which the church must go about this work of seeking souls. You might say it's also the means. The means of conversion in the hand of God is the, the church's preparedness. The means of conversion in the hands of God is, are these swift feet of the church to go and share the good news. Notice how that's over and over again, how this is evidence in the text. Um, rise and go towards the south, Philip. Even the sense of the commissioning um, requires Philip to be urgent. The, later on, we, we see that Philip rose and went. Uh, and then in verse 29, the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot, Philip runs to him. Philip says, do you understand? 
He initiates conversation and he hears this man reading aloud. He can't wait to have the opportunity. The, the man says, how can I unless someone guides me? So Philip joins him in the chariot to guide him. He reads his scripture and Philip patiently waits with him. Opens his mouth, the readiness, the eagerness. Philip is captured. Himself, he is convicted of the urgency of the matter at hand, of the power of the proclamation of the name of Jesus. And so he's ready. Verse 35, Philip opened his mouth. He spoke. He didn't keep silent. He spoke. He was ready to do his Savior's bidding. And beginning with this scripture, beginning with the scripture, is the readiness. You know, like he just gives some... Quick explanation of Isaiah 53, 7. Oh, that, he began there and was, if opportunity affords, let me unfold the whole thing to you. Philip was ready. In fact, later on, the, the eunuch himself, after hearing this message of salvation, he's convicted. And Philip no doubt told him, those who trust on this Jesus will be saved. And the, the, the only thing to do if you believe this message is to be baptized for the forgiveness, for the remission of sins, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and be baptized, and align yourself to Jesus, and be baptized, and testify that you belong to him, and be washed in the waters of the Spirit. And the Philippian, you know, convicted of this, as the, as the, as the, uh, as the, 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 the chariot is, is going and jousting from side to side, and he sees this, he sees water, he sees, uh, he sees this water there and, and he remembers what Philip said. Philip said, this is the savior of the world and men ought to cast their all on him and to trust him. And we've been going around baptizing those who say, all to Jesus, I surrender. We've been going around baptizing those who say, all for Jesus, all I have and am and ever hope to be. Those who say, Christ, my hope in life and death, and who forsake everything. To We've been baptizing them, and the Ethiopian sees water, and he says, I'm ready. I'm ready. I've forsaken all that I am, all my position, all my power, all my privilege. All I want is Jesus. And because all I want is Jesus, he says, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? I don't want any sense anymore that there's a privilege of God's people I cannot partake in. What prevents me from being baptized? Philip says, absolutely nothing. The man is ready. Sometimes the church is not ready because we do all kinds of things to hinder certain people. We, we, we put hindrances in people's ways. Peter, Philip says, nothing, nothing will hinder you. Are we ready? Are we ready like that? Ready to talk to all kinds of people about the way of Jesus? Ready to confess Christ, the readiness of the church? We must be ready, and that's the means. And, and Philip is an is a encouragement to us, a challenge to us to search our hearts and to be ready, to be, to be prepared to share the good news of Jesus, to tell the good, this is good news. Be ready. Be ready. The last thing I'll say here tonight is, in this story, again, it's stress for us. We can't miss it, can we? The, we we're not going to force people, and we're not going to, there's no prejudice here. We're not going to discriminate. There's not a particular person that we're going to eye up as being, uh, as being, uh, deserving of the gospel. We, um, we're going to preach and read the scriptures and teach them and, te and point, tell people about Christ through the scriptures with a sense of alacrity, with urgency, with, with preparedness. We're going to do all that. And yet when all is said and done, it is a sovereign work of God. It's only God who can truly save. You can't miss it, Right? Philip doesn't wake up all of a sudden and say, let me go and find someone to share the gospel with. Well, it's not in this context here. Philip is not walking alongside the road and he's of his own volition and bumping into... No, we're told explicitly that Philip is told to go to this part of 
of um, this part of Gaza. And to, it's all ordained. It's all preordained. All God's servant hand. The time of day. The point at which the the point at which the, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch would be op- would be reading uh, in the scroll that, that portion of Isaiah he'd be reading. Everything is ordained. Why him? Why the Ethiopian eunuch? Now there's 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 there's, there's answers to that that we can make. We can say that the Ethiopian eunuch and his salvation was demonstrative. It was demonstrating that. The gospel was going from Jerusalem to Samaria and to Judea and to the ends of the earth. The Ethiopian eunuch is, was evidence of that. The gospel is spreading. Now, what Jesus Christ promised in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that the Spirit would make them witnesses to the ends of the earth, was happening right before their very eyes. Absolutely. God is fulfilling his plan. But why this man in particular? It's only God's sovereign work. God's sovereign work. God is in charge. He's the one that truly calls souls. God is the one who truly brings men, ultimately that brings men and women to a knowledge of himself. It's all God. It's to God be the glory. And in all our efforts, in all our commitment to seek the conversion of souls. We must remember that this is God's sovereign work. It would make us it, it, it make us committed to prayer, right? And we won't give up on people. We won't say, oh, this person can't be saved because they're hard. Because it's God. Nothing is too difficult for him. We'll be committed to prayer. We won't abuse the means of grace. We won't see the need to manipulate. Uh, we won't need to see, uh, see the need to exploit. Because God is sovereign, and we trust him. But you can see that the sovereignty of God in salvation was never a hindrance to the means, to the preparedness. Peter, Philip doesn't say, oh, wow, this is all ordained by God for me to bump to the Ethiopian. I don't have to share the gospel with him. He'll be saved, right? He sits there. He explains to him, breaks things down to him. Surely he pleads with him. Surely... He, 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 he bids him to choose Christ today. Surely, he says, trust him, follow after him. Right? It's not a hindrance uh, to that. It doesn't it exclude means and our efforts, but it is God's sovereign work. And to him be praised. He's the only one that can truly save. And see how this uh, encounter is, is summarized, how it ends. Because the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, Verse 39, interesting way of, of, he's caught up. It's almost like he's raptured. I don't mean, you know what I mean. He's caught up. There's something miraculous about this. Um, The eunuch saw him no more, but he didn't need to, right? It's God's glory. It's not about Philip. It's about God. He didn't need to see no more. And he goes on his way rejoicing. And this is, um, the repeated, repeated statement in the book of Acts that coming to know the grace of God fills his people with joy. Fills his people with joy. And um, we, can be, we can be thankful to God that that's what we're involved in, contrary to what people say. We're not involved in, 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 in bullying people and making people's lives hard, as it were, we're not involved in leaving people hopeless and damning them. It's not our, it's not our savior. It's not our mission. We're involved in ushering them into true joy. True joy. True joy. That's what we're involved in. We tell them about the God who made them and who's merciful to them, who's reconciled. And although he could destroy them and condemn them, he's placed his wrath upon his son. And now they can come and know true joy. They don't have to keep faking it. They can trust him and rest. We, we usher them into joy if they receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and this is, this is nothing to be ashamed of then. This is something that we should pursue with all our heart. Through the sovereign mercy and grace of God, we should, we should go all in to seek 
the conversion of souls. Amen.